know to get to know to get the government. I just told you the truth. Remove the lights, just a little turn. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we were. This one, too. Yep. Yeah. Excuse me, take seven. Are you enjoying the experience of doing these interviews? Not particularly. Why not? Well, I'm a human being, just like you. Um, I sleep, I dream, and as a result, um, a lot of these things uh, come back in more vivid ways than either of us would like. They can do something as dramatic as rolling a first-term Prime Minister who, until just a few months ago, was riding supremely high in the polls. This has been a very busy two and a half years. Obviously, yesterday was a very, very difficult day for Kevin Rudd. I accept that the government has lost track. We will get back on track. I have taken control for precisely that purpose. A midnight knock on the door, followed by political execution, is no way that the Australian Prime Minister should be treated. What is it that troubles you? Well, to recall these difficult times is just painful. And the thing that's most painful through it all uh, is just the, um, the active sense of betrayal. Betrayal by people who were very close to you and uh, betrayal by people who you thought you could trust. Oh, um, well, you don't have too many moments like that in your life, thank goodness. Um, and I think the sense of uh, regret that we didn't need to be here, uh, the sense of, you know, friendship lost, uh, something very special lost, uh, the sort of team ability of the two of us, uh, that that was, you know, sitting very heavily on me. leaves for Copenhagen tonight, but not before. This is going to be a very tough and hard negotiation. I'm going to go there and give it my absolute. by failure if there isn't an agreement reached. The run-up to Christmas 2009. Kevin Rudd was leaving for the Global Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen. I wish I had a crystal ball to tell you how it's going to turn out. I think Kevin dreamed big dreams for his role at Copenhagen. Now, would you call that vanity or would you call that focused on the task of getting a global climate agreement? Well, in the way of political leadership, I think it's a bit of a mix of both. As the Prime Minister headed off to seek an historic international deal, the omens for the government in domestic politics were bad. He left behind a period of turmoil, which ended the political consensus on climate change. And the final ballot was won by Tony Abbott. 42 votes to 41. 42, 41. In Abbott's favour on the second ballot. The last thing we should be doing is rushing through a great big new tax just so that Kevin Rudd can take a trophy to Copenhagen. Thank you. 
Tony Abbott's first act as leader was to vote down the carbon pollution reduction scheme, the CPRS, with the support of the Greens. The earth will not... There being 33 ayes, 41 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. This new political reality would haunt Kevin Rudd in Copenhagen increasing the pressure to come away with a global deal. We connected a very significant policy reform, which was basically very difficult to sell in a domestic political environment, to the outcome of an event we didn't control. I remember it was bloody cold. It's Copenhagen, it's December. <laughs> and uh, and uh, none of us knew how this was going to turn out. One hundred and fifteen leaders and thousands of delegates converged on the Danish conference centre, including the two most powerful leaders in the world. It was hard to manage the expectations. This enormous gathering of political decision-making capacity helped fuel the hope that by some miraculous uh, 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 process, a, a consensus will certainly emerge. Rich countries were asking the poor countries to accept a binding global agreement to reduce emissions uh, in order to deal with climate change, which was fundamentally a problem that the rich countries had created through 200 years of industrialisation. Prime Minister Rudd, how yeah. yeah, the talk's progressing. Uh, difficulty. The resistance to a new global agreement was coming from the powerhouses of the developing world, China and India. Negotiations broke down. Kevin Rudd gave the Australian press an off-the-record briefing. The details were leaked. You called the Chinese rat fuckers. I cannot recall, because I'd frankly not been to sleep for a couple of days. Does it sound like you? Uh, well, I'm a person given often to fairly direct speech. And it's pretty disappointing when you have the concerted opposition of a couple of other countries who are so significant in the world. Tonight, officials will work late trying to agree the text of the political agreement world leaders will sign on Friday. And at 10 o'clock on the second last day, 10 p.m., uh, I got a message on my phone that said, please bring the Prime Minister to a small room above the conference centre. We were meeting almost continuously for hours after hours. Kevin stood up to those people who wanted to say no on, on, on climate change. Barack Obama had left. Uh, Premier Wen Jiabao had left. Uh, and Kevin Rudd stayed in the room with the remaining leaders and officials and continued the meeting going. Although we didn't get the full treaty, the fact that we got a Copenhagen Declaration, which has now led uh, to the next stage that will be worked through this year, is in no small measure due to him. The Copenhagen Accord may not be everything that everyone hoped for, but this decision of the Conference of Parties is a beginning, an essential beginning. By that stage, it was unnewsworthy because the colour and movement had uh, dictated uh, in the mind of global public opinion that this had failed. Kevin Rudd returned from Copenhagen to the beginning of the summer holidays. We thought in the public service, you know, he'd come ridiculously close to pulling something off that seemed just impossible, really. And he came so close to doing it. That was something of which he should have been really, really proud, you know? Um, <laughs> instead, he was, uh, he was quite despondent. Of course I was disappointed. It was human nature to be disappointed. You've thrown your everything at it, and of course, it's only partly worked. That's life but I'm also a deeply resilient person. 
The Abbott views the Copenhagen Accord as a failure. Rudd was crazy to try to rush us into his great big new tax and everything. Rudd was facing an election year in 2010. And now, deadlock over climate change. After Copenhagen, uh, with uh, Tony Abbott as the new leader, uh, minds obviously turn to, should we have an early election? have an early election to secure climate change, uh, have an early election when uh, you would anticipate that uh, Tony Abbott and his team would be pretty unprepared. <laughs> we had Abbott's measure. We had him at that point in time. We would have nailed him to a post if we'd gone to an election at the start of 2010. <laughs> Rudd made no decision on election timing. He and his colleagues retreated for the holidays. The Prime Minister took up residence at Kirribilli House. On the 2nd of January, a relaxed looking Rudd hosted a reception for the Pakistani cricket team. We worked that out. <laughs> Two days later, Gillard came for a meeting. Just the Prime Minister and his deputy. No advisers. Their memories of it are fundamentally different. We were staring out at Sydney Harbour. I remember very clearly. We were sitting on the, uh, the patio outside uh, Kirribilli. I looked at Kevin and thought he has not refreshed over this Christmas New Year period. Then she went straight to the point. She would thought about it a lot over the summer and she concluded that there are no reasons uh, that she could um, support us having a double dissolution uh, on climate change. Every bit of me read him as uh, reluctant to go to an early election, not, you know, physically, um, psychologically in the zone uh, to go and fight an election campaign. I was seriously worried about his psychological state. I thought he wasn't coping uh, and he wasn't showing any signs of finding a way back to coping. Gillard now claims she had doubts about the Prime Minister's capacity to do his job. At that point, if you'd asked him to make a huge decision as Prime Minister on that day, yes, I would have been concerned about his capacity. Uh, my sense of him at that point was that he was uh, spent in a physical and a psychological sense. If that was a serious view on Julia's part at the time, then she would have had an obligation to go to the National Security Committee of the Cabinet and put it forward. It didn't form any element, direct or indirect, in our conversation. It's absolute bollocks. Did you share your concerns with any of your close colleagues? Not particularly, no. I wouldn't, with colleagues, have been saying, I feel this about Kevin personally, or I think this about Kevin's psychological state. I would have been saying to them things like, uh, he's very tired, he found Copenhagen very hard. I've heard that theory proffered very lately. I didn't hear it at the time. He came back tired, as you would expect, but as to a change in behaviour, I saw no evidence of that at all, no evidence of any incapacity. Well, it's up to people to make their own judgments, but no one was saying that at the time. Well, I just thought that uh, he, um, he, he looked sort of off his game. Now, I think you see plenty of people in politics from time to time who get uh, like that, including my, myself. The Treasurer had spent his holiday on the Queensland coast, reading Treasury Secretary Ken Henry's thousand-page tax review. This number one recommendation was a resource rent tax. And what was very much on my mind at this stage was we are now beginning to see the early signs of mining boom mark two. You're on 612 ABC Brisbane. I'm Madonna King. It's 17 minutes to nine and you're listening to the Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. According to Swan, the Prime Minister delayed the release of the review. 
Will Ken Henry's big review be out before the May budget? I haven't um, worked that through with um, Wayne, uh, the Treasurer, yet. But you've and got the it treasurer I had numerous discussions with him early in that year about trying to get the Henry review on the table early, and he didn't want to do that. Uh, so, essentially, it wasn't put into the public domain early enough. So your question to me is, well, what were you, Kevin, doing on the question of uh, uh, taxation review? To which my answer is, guess what? I wasn't the Treasurer. I delegated that to the Treasurer. We came back into the active political period of the year, late January, early February, uh, and, you know, we're there with all of this stuff, CPRS, Henry Review, Asylum Seekers, Health, trying to beat it into a political plan. Of course, it's for him to decide how much is on his plate, but it certainly looked to me um, that he was prosecuting an extraordinary number of very, very big issues, more than more than previous Australian governments would have prosecuted in a similar period of time. How long have you been in? Well, you look after yourself. Good day. I sit on your bed here. I'm Kevin. One of the government's biggest election promises, an overhaul of the country's hospital system, was months behind schedule. I think your story is like the one I hear right across Australia. You said about the health system, you said you're going to take it over. What happened to you taking it over in July last year? Now you're saying you're going to take it over in the future. When is that going to be? How can we trust you if you keep giving us different dates? Hello, Kevin. Kevin Rudd and Health Minister Nicola Roxon crisscrossed the country visiting hospitals and clinics. There was growing frustration that it was hard to get calls on the big decisions. Instead, we did a lot of travelling and a lot of um, holding hands and talking to people that, that actually the doctors and nurses and community loved. So again, I'm not critical of that contact, but we didn't use it to move our political position. The future of health and hospital reform was a political debate with the premiers and chief ministers. Hi, folks, how are you all? Secondly, I had to win that debate within their own turf, speaking from their own hospitals. Okay, guys, how are you? And the whole point was to maximise the pressure and the leverage on them and hold them directly accountable to their own people about, well, do you want to cooperate with the Commonwealth on fixing your hospitals? Or are you going to stay with a system which is starting to see those hospitals crumble? Away from the cameras, Nicola Roxon claims she was increasingly frustrated by Rudd's work methods. He was always incredibly um, charming to me. I mean, he was demanding, and I, I didn't mind that. But I didn't like seeing him um, abuse other staff. He was rude to people. He was dismissive of their work. He would, you know, tear things up in front of people. There were ministers in his cabinet who were far more uh, ill-mannered and rude in the handlings of public servants than Kevin. Kevin Rudd was not uh, the rudest person in his cabinet by a long shot. See you tomorrow. Okay. See you later. He took on a lot and it did put the... It put his public service advisers under a lot of pressure. Is there a particular moment that you recall where you thought it had gone too far? No, not really, no. This was... <laughs> yeah, this was something that uh, developed quite slowly, really. Um, I'm going to avoid using a particular phrase that comes to mind, but... What is it? I just said I'm going to avoid it. But, you know, one of those slow-moving catastrophes. Mm. Train wreck. You said it. Yeah, that's right. Didn't look like it at the time, but, you know... It, in retrospect, that's what we were witnessing. It's a question for public servants who are not shrinking violence, who are senior experienced women and men, to tell you uh, that, hey, you got a bit too much on, Prime Minister. That's the way it works. That's the normal way at which it works. Was government 
prevented from functioning properly. Well, what does that mean? Um, no, I don't think so. Functioning properly means that they were attending to the things that absolutely had to be attended to. Those things happened. Um, no, this concern has more to do with the way that the the big issues that the government had identified for itself to prosecute, that those big issues were not being dealt with as well as they might. Does that mean there is some justification for the Prime Minister being removed? Well, that's quite an extension of this point. No, um, I, no, I don't think so. I, I, uh, well, that's not what I thought at the time. And even in retrospect, I think... Um, and that's not the question I've asked myself. The question I've asked myself is uh, whether there shouldn't have been a, um, a deeper quality conversation with the man about what needed to change. Health was a popular cause for Labor at a time when the government's negatives were mounting. Labor will never deliver a surplus under Kevin Rudd. This really is a government which has completely lost control of Australia's it's border. A government comprised of border protection deniers. But something is dramatically wrong. Yeah, there, there is, is an a avalanche of waste. Off you the go, bunker mate. home ventilation scheme. Yes, mate. Uh, we've been talking about this since August of last year. Another and worker installing ceiling insulation has died, this time in far north Queensland. A 25 year old man was electrocuted. Um, it's just horrific. Um, and um, uh, it is every mum's and dad's worst nightmare. Thanks, guys. The home insulation program was shut down. Halfway through a term, of course you go through a difficult period. Of course you start getting some challenges. What happened though was, the second we started having some challenges, the Labor Party began to panic. A group of Labor senators, well outside Rudd's inner circle, were so spooked, they began meeting discreetly. They start, as all meetings do, innocently. The view that emerged was that the government was perilously close to losing ability to be elected or re-elected. So who was in those meetings? Uh, in the Senate, myself, uh, Senator Hutchins, Senator Farrell, uh, Senator, Senator Feeney, David Feeney from Victoria. Look, I don't think anybody contemplated changing uh, changing leader. Um, that was not what was um, in the minds of the people, um, you know, going along to those, uh, to those meetings. What we had hoped would happen is that Kevin would see that there were problems, uh, address those problems and get us back on track to win a second term. The mood in caucus was pretty dark and, you know, very concerned about our political prospects. Did you warn Kevin Rudd that caucus was unhappy? Oh, look, I wouldn't have put my... I didn't put my discussions to Kevin on the basis of, you know, caucus is unhappy. Um, I put my discussions to Kevin on the basis of what's the best campaign strategy for us. We'll say the matters of the deepest concern, you won't let it rest. The government was still ahead in the two-party vote. But polling on Tony Abbott's performance had improved. Good day, how are you? How's things? Not too bad. Have a good day. Thank you. Kevin was certainly looking for opportunities to reignite um, the public's imagination and confidence in him. The Prime Minister challenged the opposition leader to a debate on health. A first class hospital system 
is basic to the Australian figure. The waiting times for elective surgery and for emergency departments are just too it's long. It's time, frankly, the Liberal Party stopped just engaging in negative politics all the time. 80% of Tony's speech before was just negative attacks on the government. I and tell you what, Kevin... It reminded me, reassured me, confirmed in my mind that Kevin, when push came to shove, was a very good campaigner and could take Abbott. After the debate, Rudd confidant and Labor power broker Mark R. Bibb sent Rudd a one-line email. You slaughtered him. Mojo, really back. It should have given comfort and there should have been faith in his ability. We should have had more appreciation of his skills, um, but we didn't. If anything, this tragedy of Labor in this period is about that. The humanity of it, the poor judgments that are made, the ambitions, the egos, you know, and the darker arts that some people are drawn to, the backgrounding and the leaking and the backstabbing. The government got a bump in the polls from health, but it didn't last. Some of the biggest campaign issues remained unresolved. Above all, what to do with the government's climate policy, in limbo since Copenhagen. Power is going up and going up fast uh, if Mr Rudd's great big new tax uh, gets through the parliament. So no matter what happens, an ETS must remain the centrepiece of your response to climate change. There is no way, Barry, that when you're dealing with uh, big challenges in the future of really bringing down greenhouse gas emissions, that you can walk away from emissions trading. No one knew what the game plan was, I think. Try and renegotiate it, try with the Greens uh, to get it through Parliament. Kevin's, you know, delay and... and obvious difficulty in grappling with such an important decision just led to this corrosion of confidence in his leadership uh, over those months. Party Secretary Carl Batar was arguing internally to drop the CPRS. Carl Batar said to me that the polling uh, on the emissions trading scheme called the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme was diabolical, that people had turned very strongly against it. This thing needed to be dumped. What the polling research was telling us at that point and what was also true when you just walked the streets and got the feel of it anecdotally uh, was that we'd never explained to people that there was a cost for the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme. <laughs> Julia Gillard's performance, meanwhile, was receiving favourable attention. She had huge work areas and very large reforms in education and industrial relations. What an honour to have you here. And she performed them, I think, beyond people's expectations, actually. She was tremendous in question time. Well, isn't this telling us everything we need to know about the shallow? hypocritical, incorrect campaign being run by those opposite. I think our strongest performer at that time, and uh, so her stocks were riding high. And it's little wonder that when confidence fell in Kevin Rudd, people start thinking, who's next? That the gaze goes to Julia Gillard. You're in real form, uh, a rich vein of form, um, and they're saying that uh, that you will be the next Prime Minister, um, you know, if Kevin Rudd happens to um, to retire at some point. Is there a succession plan in place? <laughs> Look, uh, Carl, I'm giving people some clear advice. Apparently, you can bet on centre bet. Don't do it. The evolution of, uh, of Julia uh, as the potential uh, uh, next Labor Prime Minister had already started, and people started to admire, I think, the way in which she could actually get things done. Autumn in Canberra. The budget was only weeks away. One week in late April saw a series of decisions come to a head 
in the crowded agenda. It began with a deal with the states on health, billions of dollars in extra funding in return for guarantees of better patient care. All the state and territory leaders signed up, except one. A seismic shift in Commonwealth state relations in the delivery of health care for Australians. Well, not wishing to rain on the parade, but <laughs> uh, Western Australia will not be signing. Discussions with the premiers moved to the proposed mining tax. By now, the rifts in the government were starting to show. Both Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan knew I opposed it. Leading into that COAG meeting, I don't know what the relationship between he and Kevin Rod Rudd was, but it did seem to me they weren't entirely on the same page. <laughs> By Wednesday, a decision had to be reached on the future of the emissions trading scheme. It was very, very late to the meeting, like hours, I think, from memory. And he was out in the courtyard with uh, um, one of his staffers. After four months of searching for the right answer on this question, this was D-Day. We were getting close to finalising the budget, and this was the cabinet subcommittee meeting that was required to make a decision. Journalists came and went in the courtyard, unaware of the pending decision. Each time I would carefully turn the page over uh, and then we'd continue the discussion. This was a big policy change. It flowed right through the budget, and so leaving it to the last minute wasn't really an option. I mean, I suppose the Treasurer would say you were already pretty close to the last minute by then. He'd be right. It was, uh, you know, tense. Uh, I was frustrated uh, at the lack of decision. I was putting my arguments forcefully, uh, but it wasn't unknown in our internal discussions for people to put their arguments forcefully. But just on, the, on that principal issue itself, you thought it was the right thing to do to delay the ETS and you were arguing forcefully for that? Yes, I was. I certainly agreed by that stage it was the right decision to, to defer it. I had my most senior colleagues fundamentally opposed to my continuation with this policy. It was a question of government unity at the most senior levels. No, that's rubbish. Uh, I, I said clearly uh, on more than one occasion, you know, if your judgment call, Kevin, is to go out and fight this thing, then let's go. I yielded to their collective position, um, but I did so uh, on the condition that we then have a full deliberation in time for the full cabinet meeting. The decision to put the emissions trading scheme on the back burner remained a secret from cabinet colleagues. I had absolutely no idea the conversation was going on at all. Uh, I was a member of the climate change subcommittee of the cabinet. Uh, the discussion wasn't happening there. I knew that Mark Arbib and Cal Batar had a view that we should pull back. Uh, I had a different view, but I didn't advance it in private conversations because I was waiting for the issue to come to Cabinet. A week later, the decision was leaked to the media. The first I learned was when Lenore Taylor published an article on the front page of the paper. Australia's plan to cut greenhouse gas emissions has been put in the freezer. It's the Morning Herald anyway. It'll be off the agenda for at least three years. Describe your response to that. A jaw on the floor. I was just shocked. Kevin Rudd today jettisoned his key climate change policy. Political pragmatist or political coward? The whole debate has turned sour for the government, so what it's now saying... That morning, Kevin Rudd was travelling to an event at a hospital in Western Sydney. This was um, demonstrably a premeditated leak by somebody who wanted to entrench the position. And they succeeded. Turn right. We had no time to uh, manage an effective communication strategy to the Australian public. It was supposed to be a visit to spruik the benefits of the recent hospitals agreement. What's your total bed capacity at the hospital? 
Close to the I've seen Kevin angry quite a lot, but I've never seen him as angry as he was that day. Absolutely icy, cold anger. Okay, ready to rock and roll up there? Camera is okay? The implementation uh, of a carbon pollution reduction scheme in Australia will be delayed. A little while back you said that climate change was the greatest moral, economic and social challenge of our time. With this now being delayed, do you still believe that to be the case? Now, climate change remains a fundamental uh, economic um, and environmental and moral challenge for all Australians and for all peoples of the world. It just he has to take responsibility as the Prime Minister for that misjudgment, but so do all of the rest of us. Thanks, folks. It's got to be in Sydney. As a party, we have to look back on that decision and understand what was it about the way we made the decision that we thought we could get away with dumping such a totemic and important policy for Rudd. It was a huge, huge mistake. Um, and the reality is it was done with the complicit support of almost every single source of advice and authority within the party, except Penny Wong. For the first time since their victory in 2007, Labor was behind in the two-party vote. According to news poll, the government lost a million voters in a fortnight. But the biggest hit was to Kevin Rudd's personal popularity. It fell 11 points, the steepest single fall in the history of the poll. I was quite surprised at how hard the poll hit for his standing was, uh, but I did understand that the government would face huge, you know, backflip issues. I wasn't naive about that, but the, the big personal plummet for Kevin, I didn't foresee that. In my heart of hearts, uh, and deep in my guts, I knew it was going to turn out that way once we saw the sequence of events and this devastating leak uh, to the Sydney Morning Herald um, um, by persons with a particular interest. Kevin was very fragile in the face of uh, criticism, including the, the implied criticism uh, that comes with bad polls or bad news stories. I mean, I think uh, for him, uh, across his life, and perhaps some of this is explained by the hardship of his early years, but across his life, he felt uh, the need for uh, himself to be filled by the approval of others. So clearly there's a, a hole uh, that needs to be filled by applause and and approval. Uh, the first thing I'd say about that is I haven't seen Julia's university qualifications as a psychoanalyst. Tony Burke had recently been promoted by Kevin Rudd, but privately Burke was losing faith in the Labour leader. I thought the policy calls we were making had started to be wrong. I thought our capacity to communicate had all but evaporated. And I thought we were probably headed to a defeat. You put those three together, for me, that was enough to talk about what you ordinarily wanted. Soon after the dramatic drop in the polls, Burke decided the moment had come to raise the leadership with Julia Gillard. I grabbed a bottle and took it downstairs to, to Julia's office in the Deputy Prime Minister's room. I thought that personally he was incredibly bonded to me and supportive of me and that was wonderful to feel that you had that kind of friend. I left it till the very end. I, I wanted to make sure yeah, neither of us were in a leadership cha challenge conversation but I did want Julia to know uh, that I believed at some point she'd be Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, and I also wanted her to be able to deny that I'd said anything. Uh, so I just left the, the final comment. Uh, there's one issue tonight we haven't spoken about. If you ever want to raise it with me, don't hesitate. So how did you respond when he raised the issue of leadership? It's a yeah. big moment. It is a big, yeah. So Tony, Tony and I had a, a, a drink and a chat 
it was clear to me that in his version of the future, uh, that would be me stepping up for the leadership of the Labor Party. Uh, and once again, uh, that was a you know sort of discussion uh, a bit carried out in um, metaphors uh, rather than very straight talking. Uh, and I was you know keen not to see it progress uh, to a further more explicit stage. According to Tony Burke, his New South Wales colleague, Senator Mark Arbib, was also canvassing leadership change. Mark and I had spoken about it a lot, but neither of us had had a conversation where Julia had given any indication she'd be willing to. Neither of us. We also knew if we spoke to anyone about it who, who didn't agree, and it went straight back to Kevin, uh, then the consequences um, would simply mean our capacity to influence anything had disappeared. Abib wasn't just a senator. A senior factional player from the New South Wales right, he was crucial to Rudd's rise and part of his inner circle in government. From uh, the beginning, I listened to Mark Abib's advice. At that stage, what I found about um, uh, Mr. Arbib was that he'd been an exceptionally hard-working and incisive uh, political operator. These are a narrow set of political skills which are essential in political warfighting, but they leave open other questions in terms of uh, whether there is a soul ticking in there. For a year, Arbib had been working closely with Julia Gillard as a junior minister in her portfolio. Now we uh, need someone to climb up and down a pole, do we? You always embarrass me at press conferences. Why is it? Mark had been in this um, uncomfortable position with Kevin, uh, where he was uh, never afraid to speak truth to power. Uh, one of Kevin's uh, standard reactions to that uh, was to put Mark, as we used to refer to it, in the freezer, uh, refuse to see him or speak to him or deal with him meaningfully for a period of time. So, yes, I, I absolutely understood that that was an increasingly troubled relationship. Have you or your supporters been sounded out by anybody about the prospect of uh, replacing the Prime Minister? Absolutely not, no. Completely ridiculous, Neil. Kevin Rudd looks on the nose, you've got two disastrous polls, and I would be astounded if there aren't people in the party saying, we've got to change to Julia or at least think about it. You may as well ask me, am I anticipating taking a trip to Mars? Uh, no, I'm not, Neil. The drop in polls fed into caucus anxiety about the party's election prospects. It led to a single-minded focus on news poll and Nielsen in Fairfax. I think with hindsight, a focus that was out of all proportion. You'd read the polls and discuss the polls and go back to the polls and discuss this level and what was happening in this state and the preferred rating here ad nauseum. And that little closed, narrow, disproportionate focus then led to more serious discussions. First term MP Bill Shorten was part of those discussions. Like all of us, Bill did see that Kevin was uh, heading over a cliff. Him and a whole lot of other people um, were terribly pessimistic about our, our prospects. Bill's main concerns were what polling was showing in some of the seats in Victoria, in some of the marginal seats. So that's what he was expressing to me, concerned about that. There were a number of people in that caucus, uh, people like Mark Arbib, uh, Bill Shorten, David Feeney, people who could carry blocks of votes with them, um, who by this stage were feeling uh, extremely frustrated. Like Bill Shorten, most of the agitators were new to federal politics. Don Farrell, David Feeney and Mark Arbib had entered Parliament less than two years earlier. 
having won their seats in Kevin Rudd's 2007 election victory. To be honest, I didn't take it that seriously. I thought, no, there's just a few unhappy people. Uh, they're going to keep being unhappy. They haven't been promoted to a parsec or they haven't been promoted to uh, the ministry. What I did not know uh, was that they had successfully built uh, a campaign that reached out to many, many more people. You should go and ask questions to. A number of people had been working towards a change, but they were patient and thoughtful men, and so they allowed the ball that was rolled down the hill to slowly gain momentum, and it did. With the government's capital depleted by the decision on climate change, Wayne Swan and Kevin Rudd announced the introduction of the mining tax. From the 1st of July 2012, we will apply a 40% tax to profits from resource projects. In 2010, Australia was in the midst of one of the biggest commodity booms in its history. The price of iron ore had increased by 600% over its long-term average. And this was an enormous windfall for Australia. And the government wanted to make sure that this windfall, which it knew would be temporary, was, would be converted into long-term prosperity for Australians. We should have taken the mining tax to an election. It's that simple. I regard the um, mining tax debacles as one of the lost opportunities of government. It was there to be one by proper consultations with the industry because they were up for a profits-based tax. It was their submission. And to put it bluntly, we lost it. We made our own mess. The mining industry did not create the mess. We created the mess. It's a disgrace. The Treasurer should resign. He's an absolute failure. We should get rid of him. It's abhorrent and it should be eliminated immediately. The proposed super tax is the number one sovereign risk priority we face anywhere in the world. There was an insufficient period of consultation, but I firmly believe it would have made no difference to the size or the force of the campaign that would have come out of the mining industry. It just provided them with the sort of public excuse they really needed for a campaign they were going to run anyway. Australian mining is a world leader. It saw our country through the GFC. Weaken mining, you weaken the country. But that's exactly what the government's new super tax is doing. We real community... The mining industry launched a $22 million campaign to defeat the tax. We're going to keep mining strong. I was sitting next to Sean Kelly and I saw an ad come on air. We're real families. We're working families. And I looked over at Sean and I said, mate, Neil Lawrence made that ad, the man who had made the Kevin 07 ads, and we are in a lot of trouble. And they are going to campaign against you in key marginal seats, particularly in Queensland and Western Australia. Uh, we don't intend to be intimidated by uh, anyone on this question because we believe this is a right decision in the national interest. Kevin Rudd claims Swan misled him about the industry's willingness to accept the model of the tax the government had put forward. He led it. It was his initiative. He recommended it. He ultimately worked really hard on Julia and myself to bring us on side. What I think we are both really stunned by, and myself in particular, was that so much of the legwork had not been done with the mining companies. Well, everybody knows that there's never a political issue that Kevin Rudd has ever not put his fist in or his head in. Uh, and he, he's, he's got many failings, uh, but you could say one of his great strengths was he never let anything go by that he at least wasn't fiddling with. So he was deeply involved in all of the discussions I had. Rudd and Swan worked together early in their political careers in the Queensland government. That's the Wayne had been an extraordinary talented uh, campaign director, had been, I believe, a huge factor in Queensland's success in the 1989 elections. We need to have they went to the same school. Kevin Rudd was godfather to one of Swan's children. We were a close, uh, a close team, uh, friendly at a personal level. <laughs> In federal politics, they fell out bitterly over the Labor leadership contests. 
but managed to mend the relationship to work well in government. How would you describe your relationship with Wayne Swan at that stage? Uh, professional and personal, actually. Um, and I thought we had um, buried all problems from the past. If we do, there's no reason we can't be the envy of the world over the coming years. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. Yeah. At the end of the budget week, Swan and Rudd flew home together. I remember being on this flight uh, with uh, Mr Swan uh, to uh, Brisbane. And I looked up to him and said, you know, this is going to get pretty willing. It's going to get pretty difficult. I assume, Wayne, that uh, you are strong and solid with this all the way through. He said, are you with me? And I said, yes, I am. Did you mean the mining tax or did you mean you as leader? I meant uh, sustaining the tax and certainly uh, withstanding any political pressure on uh, me as leader uh, coming from the factions and elsewhere. He knew, I mean, he absolutely knew uh, that, uh, that, that there were forces that were moving against him, otherwise he wouldn't have actually raised it with me. As leader of the House, Anthony Albanese was also picking up caucus disaffection. He decided to warn Kevin Rudd. I went to um, the lodge uh, to, uh, to see him uh, after Parliament got up. I was giving him uh, a, a clear indication that uh, there were some concerns around had been expressed or rumours around. He needed to be conscious of that and uh, needed to engage uh, more um, with the caucus in what I thought was the, the lead up to the election. Albo says he's concerned about what uh, the factional Bover boys are up to. He's concerned about the depth of Julia's relationship with Arbib and Batar and poses the question about where this all might lead. Did you warn him that night that his prime ministership was in jeopardy? Uh, no, because I didn't believe that that was the case. Ex what are we going to tell the prime minister? Ex the tax. For the ex the tax. The mining industry kept up its pressure on the government. Well, Rudd's public lobbying effort also continued. Super profits tax. Views differ on how he was functioning behind the scenes. He was doing things publicly, but in terms of, you know, the big decisions before the government, he was incapable of making them. He, as a sort of seasoned politician in front of the TV cameras, could, you know, turn it on. Everyone else OK? But his demeanour behind closed doors was absolutely miserable, irritated. That's the difference. Got to run, folks. If I was going to summarise it, personally miserable, politically paralysed. It's not really something that I personally felt because I had a productive relationship with Kevin. In that June, I was reinstating the Racial Discrimination Act uh, into the Northern Territory Emergency Response. That was a very tough change to, ne to negotiate. But once again, I had his support. It's an impressive rollout. It is not normal for a Deputy Prime Minister to end up running a Prime Minister's diary, chairing staff meetings on it. It's not normal uh, for a Deputy Prime Minister to be trying to manage uh, so that quality speeches are given. There's a hunting season in Parliament House. That's just before the Parliament rises for a long break, for the winter break. The tenor of the discussions became stronger, became more directed in that last fortnight. People knew that we were leaving Canberra in, uh, at the end of June, we were unlikely to uh, return, and that if a decision was going to be made, it had to be made in that last week or fortnight. 
the government had recovered its lead in the two-party vote, but the ALP's primary vote remained low. My view was that we were going to lose, uh, and I thought that not because our political position was irrecoverable, uh, but my view about our election prospects was uh, Kevin uh, wasn't in the shape to fight a campaign. Uh, he'd fight a dreadful campaign. I knew that Kevin Rudd was a great campaigner, uh, so uh, I did not think that we would uh, lose the election. Uh, Minister, every bad poll for the Prime Minister means more leadership questions for you. Have you had to discuss this with Kevin Rudd to reassure him that you're not after his job? Oh, certainly not, Fran. <laughs> Right. By this stage, you've had a series of people, Mark Arbib, Tony Burke, Bill Shorten, approach you about the leadership. Did you tell Kevin Rudd? No, because I'd, you know, one, uh, the matter of the leadership. In my view, Kevin was the leader, I was supporting Kevin, so why would you raise it? Why didn't you tell them that they were wasting their time? Well, my demeanour, obviously, was uh, that they shouldn't have this conversation with me and I wasn't interested in having it, that I just wanted to get on with the job. Uh, but I didn't want uh, there to be, you know, huge uh, sets of words of mine uh, out there that could be repeated. So I thought the best thing was just say, no, nah, you know, let's move on and get on with what we've got to do. She listened to what people were saying and obviously she was in a position to rule it out categorically and she didn't and so events move forward as a consequence of that. But I think that's sort of different to she was agitating because she wasn't agitating at all. Other people were agitating, but she didn't say no. Two weeks out, senior members of Gillard's staff began preparing for a leadership change, including a victory speech to deliver if she became prime minister. I thought that if this was going to happen, then it would be one of the more significant moments since Federation, and so we had to get it right. It was a very, very complex exercise, um, explaining the removal of the Prime Minister of Australia. Nobody told me, and one thing I know, having uh, had all of these roles in politics and having been a political staffer myself, uh, is good staff uh, war game for all sorts of possibilities. Concerned about election prospects in New South Wales, State Secretary Sam Dastiari ordered polling on four marginal seats. In Melbourne for the day, he got a call from the ALP's pollster. So I sit down, I sit down on a park bench in the middle of Lonsdale Street and there's cars whizzing past. I go, is it bad? And he goes to me, Dasher, it's worse than bad. We're bloody stuffed. Someone's gonna have to do something. Dastiari's first calls were to his New South Wales colleagues, Carl Batar and Mark Arbib. I said, Carl, I've got these numbers. This is bad. And Carl's next reaction words goes, mate, I think I know, but send them through. I sent them through to um, um, Mark Arby. Internal party polling started to be shared around the caucus. The traditional strict protocols that operated around party polling and who had access to it were starting to break down. I started getting uh, MPs calling me, telling me that um, Rudd's approval ratings that seemed was, was in the toilet. I was in Mark Arbib's office and um, he turned his computer monitor uh, towards me because I was sitting on the other side of the desk and um, started to point out some, some figures. And I had never, hadn't seen this uh, type of information before. It's very easy for political operatives um, like comrades uh, Batar and Arbib, now employees of Mr James Packer's casino empire, uh, to say the sky has fallen in um, and uh, this position is irredeemable. Anyone with any sense of very recent political history would say that was an absolute nonsense. At the weekend, a state by-election was on in Sydney's western suburbs. 
senators from the anti-Rudd camp convened on the hustings. Don Farrell and Mark Bishop joined New South Wales Senator Steve Hutchins. Voters have dished out the biggest by-election bashing in state elections. Two-party preferred basis to swing was 25 and a half percent. The sitting member who resigned in disgrace after will be a signal for Labor at the federal election. It confirmed in my mind that uh, we probably weren't going to win the next election. They shared their concerns with Wayne Swan. Steve was always very close to Wayne. They had a long-standing and deep relationship. Wayne was also very close to Don, built up over many, many years. I'm sure I would have had a discussion with uh, Steve Hutchins about that. Basically, the unpopularity of the federal government as being the flashpoint and what people were saying on the polling booths that day. Paul Howes, head of the powerful right-wing union, the AWU, was picking up leadership speculation. He also spoke to Wayne Swan. If memory serves correct, he was on his way to Canberra um, and uh, we had a conversation. He was asking me what's going on and, and I said to him, there's a lot of talk about, you know, moving on Kevin. Um, and Wayne was like, yeah, and Wayne took that seriously. Um, and uh, he very definitively said to me, there was a stupid idea and we shouldn't do it. And I agreed. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. And Wayne Swan didn't tell me a thing. And Wayne Swan had an obligation as a very senior minister in the government, the next most senior after Julia Gillard, if he was aware of an impending leadership coup, to tell his prime minister. Well, I, th I didn't expect the challenge to arise. In fact, I'd done my best to uh, head one off. If Wayne had a said at any time, listen, this is a load of nonsense. We're not going to kill the Prime Minister. You blokes over there, concentrate on your work. We will get our way through this. That would have been the end of it. That message was never received. Wayne Swan did nothing to stop movement towards a leadership change. Not that I was party to, and not that I'm aware of then, not that I am aware of now. Before Julia Gillard left Melbourne, State Secretary Nicholas Rees briefed her on Victorian polling. Julia Gillard's own polling numbers had never been higher. They were truly uh, stratospheric, certainly in Victoria. Gillard's office asked Martin Ferguson to join her on the plane trip from Melbourne. Very clear to me all the way to Canberra, she was about one thing that Sunday, about a change of a leader. But she was clearly pushing and prodding to see how I'd respond if you could only see the polling. She kept talking about the polling, 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 polling. You know, the relationship between me and Martin Ferguson was uh, not close at that time, highly estranged. And so it's just ludicrous uh, to suggest that I would be swapping confidences with Martin Ferguson. She thought I was estranged from Kibben. She misjudged my relationship with Kibben. At the lodge, the Prime Minister was on the brink of a deal with mining magnate Twiggy Forrest. Andrew Forrest and the Prime Minister were close to reaching a deal on a revised mining tax. And that was extremely significant for the government because Andrew Forrest was the embodiment of Australian mining. And if the Prime Minister and Andrew Forrest could shake hands on a deal, that would have been a big breakthrough in the policy. Well, I was a bit surprised by how far out there he was in terms of his negotiations uh, with Twiggy. Uh, but that wasn't unusual with Kevin uh, and the way in which he dealt with, with ministers. It's probably more unusual with me that he would uh, do that with me. He certainly did it with other ministers all the time. Without involving the Treasurer, Rudd and Forrest reached a deal. The Prime Minister said he'd share it with Cabinet. 
he wanted to publicly announce it as the start of a consultation program, a true consultation program, not a fictitious consultation program, which is what Swan had argued for. This, uh, the, the, the starting gun on a consultation across Australia would have started on Friday. Late in the evening, the Prime Minister took a phone call in his study. We all knew what that call was. And when he emerged a few minutes later, he raised his hands above his head and he said, 52, 48. And we knew that that meant that despite all of the challenges that the government had, despite the horrible weeks, we were ahead of the Liberals by four points in the news poll to be published the next day. <laughs> Julia Gillard began the week with an early morning meeting with Mark Arbib. Soon afterwards, she sent an email to the Prime Minister and his Chief of Staff, criticising Rudd's handling of asylum seekers, and secretly copied Mark Arbib. I copied Mark Arbib into one communication because I viewed him as an ally in trying to get this sorted out. Gillard was building a case against Kevin, probably a case that she didn't really need to make with uh, Mark Arbib because I think he was already uh, firming in his views. Labor strategist Bruce Hawker had been brought in to bolster Rudd's office. There was clearly discussions going on between the Victorians and uh, the New South Wales right, and that was concerning. There's a lot on, yeah, quite apart from uh, Xi Jinping, Jose Ramos Horta, the mining tax, Twiggy Forest, and a few other things as well, and the upcoming G20 summit. This is a very, very big week uh, for the Prime Minister and the senior ministers in the country. The Labour caucus met for the last time before the winter break. We sailed through. Hey, indeed. I then thought, oh, well, we, um, we're getting on with, on with things. In the evening, Rudd spoke at the Business Council dinner. Kevin got uh, stuck into the Business Council for their lack of commitment to fundamental reform, and I had a lot of sympathy with some of the remarks that he made, but was it unwise given how heated the issue was? Probably was. I thank you. Wayne Swan came back with me to my office for a glass of scotch after the speech and thanked me for it and thanked me for his, my defence of his tax. I spoke with Julia Gillard on the phone that night after the speech and she said she thought the substance of the speech was good. She thought I might have been a bit sharp with them, but the substance of the speech was good. And when you put the phone down, do you remember thinking anything about... No that phone call as being unusual? No. You need to just understand, my continuing operating premise is that Julia is a good person, that Julia is a loyal person. The day began with a front page story. It claimed Rudd's chief of staff had sounded out cabinet ministers and more than 30 backbenchers on their support for the prime minister. She was in her private bathroom and came out of there and we just started um, uh, going on about the article that was in the paper. You know, I've known Julia for 30 odd years and you know, I know when she was genuinely angry and she was absolutely furious. That article seemed to crystallise for me that uh, the voice in my back of, back of the head that was saying the bonds of trust are frayed here. I asked to see John Faulkner. I'm not someone who uh, dissolves into tears very often, surprise myself by uh, ending up crying as John Faulkner he sort of comforted me. You don't make a decision uh, to uh, challenge uh, for the leadership 
of the Labor Party against a first term sitting Prime Minister uh, because an article suggests that the Chief of Staff is supporting his boss to remain as Prime Minister. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We finished prayers. I was the uh, Deputy Whip, so my office was just outside the Senate chamber and uh, David Feeney bursts through my door, shuts the door and says, look, you know, we have to, um, we, you know, we've got to replace uh, Kevin. So we went up to Mark Bibb's office, which was upstairs. Tony Burke was called down to Julia Gillard's office. She had the newspaper article open in front of her. She said that having read it, after all the loyalty that she had been showing in trying to fix the government, she felt she only had two choices. Either to stand down as Deputy Prime Minister and go to the backbench, or to challenge. Uh, Tony uh, said to me that his view was I had two choices. I should either run for the leadership or I would need to take myself to the backbench. I'd said to Julia, uh, uh, at the end of that conversation, uh, do you want me to start making some phone calls? Um, discreetly, but do you want them to start? And she said yes. Kevin uh, came round to see me uh, whilst I was in the run into question time. Her entire demeanour had changed uh, from the jewellery I'd spoken to the night before. His opening words coming in the door was, you know, you're, you're obviously uh, very, very concerned about the Sydney Morning Herald article. It's not true. As people started to be called, and it was Mark and others who were making the calls, not me, we kept working on the basis that you only had to tell one person who didn't think it was a good idea. Kevin would know. And, you know, it might be all off. So I put my office into lockdown. And I get a call from Mark just before question time. You know, he goes, mate, it's going to have to happen. You know, the Victorians are on board. Shorten and Feeney were very significant in the change. Once the leadership challenge was brought on, they did swing in behind Gillard uh, in a very big way and campaigned very strongly for her amongst the caucus and uh, shifted large numbers of votes um, behind Julia Gillard. The Prime Minister. At 2pm, the Prime Minister announced the death of three Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. I wish to express my deepest sympathy to the extended family and friends of these three brave men. Might be embarrassed Through question time, Rudd and Gillard kept up the appearance of a united leadership. We protected this economy. We made sure it did not go into recession. It was very tense what was actually going on. And I don't know whether the opposition picked it up, but there was certainly tension on the government side. Had with stimulus, this economy would have gone into recession. Alistair came in and said that he was starting to pick up calls from people saying that uh, a count was going on inside the party. A meeting with Julia Gillard was convened in the office of Victorian Senator Kim Carr. There was Mark Arbib, uh, Bill Shorten, um, David Feeney, myself, Kim Carr. She sat at, at the top of the table um, quite regally. She certainly sort of gave no commitment to, to challenge, uh, but she did give a commitment to go and talk to, uh, to Kevin about the issue. I then escorted her back um, to her office. Um, I think I said, you know, what do you think? Um, and she said, I think that these guys don't necessarily know what they're doing. In Sydney, Paul Howes was contacted by Mark Arbib. The anti-Rudd forces were reaching out to the unions. So Mark rang me. I think I had two conversations with him. And the first one, I was driving, I said, let me, let me ring you when I'm home. During that conversation, I'd asked him to show me the polling. I got home, um, I had the second conversation, was looking at the polling on my iPad or something, and um, uh, he said, you've got to make a call. Um, and so, you know, in the union, you don't do that on your own. So, and then talked to our leadership, so I drove back, straight back to the office.
the would-be challengers had another matter to settle. My phone rang and it was some senators who wanted to come and see Wayne. I said, Wayne's made his mind up, he's for Gillard. Um, do you still need to have the conversation? They said, we want to talk to him about being the Deputy Prime Minister. I said, I'd think about it, but I said I wasn't sure whether A, well, I didn't think a change of leadership was A, a good idea, B, if it was on, uh, and C, whether she was a candidate. I wasn't convinced of any of those things at that stage when we had that discussion. The five o'clock news happened, hadn't broken. The two, two other commercial stations at six o'clock still didn't break. I walked through the press gallery. Not a word. None of them had any idea. Everything was completely dead. The Minister for and then I was sitting in the chamber uh, and my phone was going crazy. And when I came out, uh, it was Mark Simpkin. Uh, and Mark said, OK, I want to read to you what I intend to open the 7 o'clock news with. The rumblings within the Labor Party are getting louder tonight. Several government sources have told the ABC that MPs are being sounded out about a possible move against the Prime Minister. The sources say Julia Gillard has not thrown her hat into the ring. I was at a function with Kevin for Nick Sherry, 6.30 to 7 o'clock. <clears throat> That's when the corridors started boiling. Most of Cabinet was taken completely by surprise. Gobsmacked. And uh, I was deeply uncomfortable about it. I did not know that was happening or being planned. It was really done very clinically and quickly. We didn't know uh, what was going on. Um, it had been very, very tightly held. To think there wasn't even a proper process of discussion with the Cabinet because they didn't want it. Um, we just killed ourselves. In terms of its professional execution, um, You'd have to say it was the best. Sources have just told me during um, the last minute or so via the text message that Julia Gillard is in um, Kevin Rudd's office as we speak. Gillard and senior Labor figure John Faulkner met with Kevin Rudd. So, no, John was there at uh, my insistence and request because it's important to have a witness uh, to... Um, uh, matters of high politics such as this. In the room, it felt still and tense, incredibly. Cut the air with a knife, tense. It is a very long conversation, and uh, I was, through my questions, seeking to understand uh, why she was behaving in the way in which she was behaving. I felt that Kevin was in denial and just not listening to the messages I was trying to give him. Not only did I listen very intently, I said, so your core proposition, Julia, is you think under my leadership this uh, government cannot be re-elected? It was about more than whether or not Kevin Rudd could win the election. Uh, we weren't running a government that was functioning the way it should. I said, we're on 52% in the polls. Have you looked at where political parties have been at this point of the political cycle in their first terms in previous governments? We're in a better position than Howard. We're in a better position than Keating, comparable position to Hawke. As the conversation continued, in a Canberra restaurant, a group of Gillard backers waited for news. I remember everyone at the table being on the phone. I took maybe four phone calls from Bill Shorten. He'd obviously, uh, at that point, um, was concerned that if you didn't do it, that there'd be repercussions. I think the last phone call, um, you know, he said to me, he said, Jerry, 
We're all fucked if she doesn't do this. I had a discussion with, uh, I guess it was the old Beasley group, um, Wayne Swan, Stephen Smith, Jenny Macklin, Stephen Conroy. I re remember very vividly leaving the room and saying, if this occurs, uh, we will kill two Labor Prime Ministers. By this time, Rudd and Gillard had been talking for more than two hours. Kevin Rudd proposed a compromise. If come the time of this election, um, I believe I can't win, then of course I would step aside. I have no interest in taking the government over a cliff. If by that stage there is a judgment uh, from John based on the party's independent research that I cannot win the election, uh, I will, at that point, uh, resign the Prime Ministership and offer an uncontested uh, succession to you. Then she began discussing the detail of how that might work. I do recall a discussion about Kevin having more time and I participated in that discussion and gave Kevin some false hope. You say false hope. Did you agree with Kevin Rudd that he could retain the Prime Ministership, stay Prime Minister? I don't know. I did not agree. I can understand why Kevin um, felt uh, that, you know, there was, there was a, you know, potential uh, wedge of sun on the horizon. She agreed. She not only agreed, but she had interrogated the detail of the formula on the way through. We shook hands. That's not a wedge of hope. I should have been more straightforward and more clinical and less discursive. Being discursive did give Kevin false hope and that's down to me. The whole temperature in the room came down. It all came down. Not just in my mind, in Faulkner's mind. Um, and uh, and uh, with her, there was a degree of calm and resolution in the room. The pressure was on from across the board, you know, for Julia not to be in the meeting. Gillard's chief of staff went to get her out. We went into um, a small room off, um, off the Prime Minister's office um, and she made some phone calls. Kevin told me with uh, John Faulkner was there that uh, it had been resolved and that there wouldn't be a challenge. An agreement uh, had been uh, had been reached uh, for more time. Uh, I called. I actually think I called Mark R. Bibb, uh, and I think Stephen Conroy was with him. Uh, and I, uh, you know, indicated them we're still having. Uh, I was still talking to Kevin. And I was due to go back in the room. Mark said that the from all the information he had, that the. Uh, numbers were overwhelmingly supporting her uh, and from everything that Mark had said to me uh, in his office I agreed. They were very clear with me that you know the majority support would be with me. You know I, I think she sort of paused for a moment and thought about it um, and uh, and recognised that um, really uh, the the challenge was occurring and um, and she went back into uh, into Kevin's office. She walked in ice cold, <laughs> ice cold, with absolute um, determination in her eyes. It was a complete transformation in five or ten minutes by a person who I had always supported in good times and in bad as she had supported me. There's something pretty gut-wrenching about all that, uh, something which uh, tears open your heart. There's going to be a news conference with the Prime Minister in about five or ten minutes from now. By that stage, if you had called it off, you would have been in a lot of trouble with your colleagues. Oh, I don't think it would have been possible, yeah. Why not? You still had choices, you always have choices. Oh, no, I mean, I'd, uh, yeah, you always have choices, but um, uh, I, I don't think there was any way of, you know, stuffing, stuffing the genie back into the bottle. Once uh, the dogs of war are unleashed, it's very difficult. 
to bring him back under control. <laughs> Journalists and hangers-on crowded into the blue room, waiting for the Prime Minister, while Gillard's office was filling with supporters. I think it had a feeling of uprising about it. I remember backbenchers, ministers coming in from everywhere, um, pouring into the office. Shorten was in the office, he was down the back, but he, um, throughout the evening, was bringing MPs, a lot of MPs from Queensland, uh, to meet with Julia. I think it's fair to say that um, uh, whatever Bill's faults may or may not be, he knows how to work the numbers and he was bringing people till late in the night. Um, Earlier this evening, uh, Julia Gillard came to see me and uh, has requested a ballot for the leadership of the Labor Party. It's become apparent to me in the course of the last period of time, the last several weeks, that a number of factional leaders uh, within the Labor Party uh, no longer support my leadership. That is why it is imperative that this matter be resolved. What brought this on? Thank you, Prime Minister. Did you say it? Okay? Jerry Kitchener recalls a final meeting with our bib. He then pulled out a ministerial list and started going through his thoughts about Julia's next ministry. He then went through and had a rant about uh, Kevin Rudd and how he couldn't be allowed in the ministry. Um, and then he came down to Bill Shorten's name and he said that um, you couldn't trust Bill Shorten, that uh, he would do Julia in, that the one thing she couldn't do was ever give him industrial relations because he'd use it to um, solidify the union base to knock her off. Thank you. Can I confirm I will be a candidate in tomorrow's ballot? And apart from that statement, I haven't got any other statement at this time. Do you have Thank any ideas? You. you know, it's, it's obviously happened in a very short period of time. At the same time, time union boss Paul Howes morning, went so public, endorsing Julia Gillard. Uh, what's important for us is that the party is that the party becomes reunified behind a strong leader. Julia Gillard is a strong leader. Have you spoken to Julia Gillard this evening? Um, I, I spoke to Julia very briefly. Um, at to tell her that the union, um, the union's position is that we're supporting, um, supporting her leadership. By now, the Prime Minister was isolated in the loneliest place in Canberra, his own office. He made a call to his oldest colleague. He phoned me and I told him that I viewed his position as being uh, untenable, uh, that he, uh, he would not win a ballot, he would be comprehensively beaten, and it was a pretty uh, blunt conversation. So the, the feeling in my guts was, well, mate, um, you could have spoken to me. You could have told me that there's something really wrong. You could have said to me, um, here's what needs to be fixed and here's what you need to do if you wish to remain as leader. That must have been a difficult conversation. Yeah, well, it was, obviously. Um, you know, but that's, that's what, uh, what's what happens in life sometimes. So it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. That was the last conversation I had with Mr Swan. You haven't spoken to him at all? No. What would you say to him if you saw him? The betrayal's pretty tough, mate. 